you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking today at one of those famous passages of Scripture. It is the Lord's Prayer or the Model Prayer. We're going to be talking about it today, but also the Scriptures that surround it. So before we dive into the Scriptures, let's pause and, and practice the word of uh, praying the Lord of God. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. I pray that as we read your words, that you will bless us today, that you will challenge us in our prayer life, that you will show us that you're a God who cares and you're a God who listens, you're a God who provides, but you're also a God who expects response from us. Prayer is not simply what we say to you, it is our listening to you, it is our response to you. It is us taking a part in your plans. It is a softening of our hearts. It is offering forgiveness to others. It is seeking you in our daily lives and then following what you call us to do. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will instruct us today. Heavenly Father, bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. A preacher was one asked, what's more important? reading the Bible or praying? And the preacher said to that person, well, what's more important to you, breathing in or breathing out? They're both important. They're both vital. Our prayer life is such that it is the life that we have, it is the relationship we have with God. We read his message, we read his will in this word, and then we go to him in prayer. Both are vitally important. And in the scripture today, and what I'm going to be reading today, a lot of the focus is on the people who would try to garner attention, who would try to pray in very eloquent, big ways, long prayers, so that everyone would look at them and say, wow, they have such a good relationship with God. And as as important as that sermon is, and as important as what Jesus says is, I honestly don't think that's the problem with a lot of people in church today. I don't think our problem is that we have a lot of people who are trying to garner a lot of attention when they pray. I think the problem in the American church is that we have a lot of people who don't pray at all. A lot of times, some people, the only time they ever pray is when they're asked to pray in in a Bible study or in a meeting or at some gathering or at at a meal. But other than that, I think a lot of times... Our problem in our prayer life is not that we're trying to garner attention. The problem in the prayer life of a lot of people is that they don't have one. So the principles we learn today, the truths that we learn in God's Word today are important, but again, I don't think our problem is showboating. I think our problem is our silence when it comes to our prayer life. He says this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You're going to hear something repeated several times in this. When you pray, when you pray, when you pray. Last Sunday, we talked about the scripture that said when you give or when you do your righteous deeds, when you do your good acts, do them in such a way that it doesn't draw attention to you, it draws attention to God. But the expectation was that you would give, that you would do those good deeds, that you would give service, that you would give aid. Today, the understanding that Jesus has for his disciples, for those who call themselves believers, those who call themselves Christians, is that they will pray. The question is not, or the answer is not, is if you pray, or should you decide to pray, But it's when you pray. So there's an understanding that this is going to be a part of our lives, that this is going to be a part of our practice. In Jesus' day, there were three times a day when they would pray. 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. And and so they would go to the synagogues, they would go to the temple, and they would pray. But let's say you're out and about, and you can't get to a synagogue, and you can't get to a temple. You would just pray out in the street at 9, at 12, and at 3. A lot of us struggle with any time during the day. Imagine if we, I came to you and said, you need to pray three times a day. 
We sang the song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, and we sang it with such beauty, with such strength. But for some of us, it will be a struggle, an absolute heartache struggle to try to spend one hour a day in prayer. Wouldn't be so sweet. We'd get about five minutes into it and be like, uh, 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 I don't know. Let me just meditate. You know, we, we have not developed a robust prayer life. But the understanding that Jesus says is that when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the person that stands up to try to get people to look at him. In Jesus' day, there were people, there were rabbis who said, whoever is long in prayer is heard. Another person said, whenever the righteous make their prayers long, their prayer is heard. Another, one Jewish prayer began like this. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. And they would start their prayer like that and just put word after word after word. Are those words true? Absolutely. Is the name of God to be blessed? Yes. Is he righteous? Absolutely. Is he magnified? Is he to be lauded? Sure. Wonderful. But they would just stack word upon word upon word upon word upon word and not for the glory of God, but so that they thought that if they prayed a long time, or these long prayers where everyone could see them, that somehow God would hear them. Now, there could be some people who do have a, have a prayer life, and you've fallen into this trap. You think you've got to pray a long time for God to hear you. Or you think you've got to speak in a, in, with different words than your everyday language. You've got to speak in King James ease for God to hear you. Or you've got to... You've got to, to Think of these long things to say and plead and bang your, your hands against the desk for God to hear you. That's not the case. That should remind you of the prophets of Baal, who thought that they had to yell to their God and be loud and play loud instruments to wake God up. Remember what the prophets of Baal did? They chanted and they sang and they yelled and they cut themselves to try to get their God's attention. You don't have to struggle to get God's attention. God loves you. God is eager to hear his people. Just as a father is eager to talk to his children, our Father in heaven is eager to hear and talk to us. You don't have to use these vain, long empty prayers, and you shouldn't try to pray to impress other people. There are going to be times where we pray publicly. We've done it several times here this morning. There are times in Sunday schools when people pray. Choir practice, people pray. Sunday school, other things, other, you know, times of meals. Jesus isn't, isn't condemning public prayer, but he is saying that there are times where you need to get away and make it between you and God, and even when you're in other people with a group, Make it about you and God and them and God. Don't make it about you and them. He says that, when, that, that to do that is to pray like the hypocrites do, like the actors who only want the applause of people. They have their reward, but when you pray, go into your room, verse 6, shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 7, and when you pray, do not heap on empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray like this then. Now before we get to the Lord's Prayer, that brings up an interesting question. If God, and, and you've heard this asked in many different ways. If God already knows what we need, then why pray? If God already knows that there's heartache, why do I need to tell Him there's heartache? Is God aware that there's strife in, in American life right now? Is God aware that there are people who are looting and burning and, and killing each other right now? Absolutely he knows that. Absolutely he knows that. He's not surprised by it. When we go to God in prayer, he's like, I didn't know that was happening. Your God knows. So the question that is often posed is, well, then why pray? Jesus here says, your Father in heaven knows your needs before you ask them. But then he gives us the prayer to pray, or at least the model of the prayer to pray. Part of it, we need to realize we don't go to God to inform God. 
we don't go to God in prayer to try and, and make him aware of something. So then why pray? If God knows it all, then why do we pray? Well, part of it is the understanding of what prayer is. Prayer is us acknowledging his greatness, acknowledging his holiness. It is, it is praising him. A lot of prayer is supposed to be thanking him for just who he is. Praise him that he is an all-knowing God, an all-seeing God, an all-present God. Thank him that he is a God of compassion and righteousness and holiness. Thank him that he is the provider and protector, our shield, our comfort, our strength. A lot of times we just need to go to God in prayer and praise him. Because he is worthy of it. Because then in our hearts, prayer can change us. Prayer should change us. It should make us remember the right relationship. We don't go to God as equals. We don't go to God as informants. We go to God as, as children. We go to God as servants. Before our king. Prayer can put us in that right understanding of who we are. I don't want to get too far into it, but he says, our Father who art in heaven. That is a re reminder of our Father, our provider, our Lord who is in heaven, who is in the holy place. That place that we are not yet. So the beginning just reminds us of that relationship. Prayer is also about being able to listen to God and put our efforts and our intentions and our, our abilities in line with what he is calling us to do. We pray about a need. We pray about a need. We pray about suffering. We pray about the lost. We pray about the hurting in our communities. And maybe in that prayer, God says, I hear, your, I hear the hurting of the people. I know there are lost around you. Here's what I want you to do about that. So sometimes prayer is, is listening to God going to him with a need, and then responding to what he calls us to do. <coughs> Sometimes we just listen, and God brings to mind a person or an individual that we know is hurting, and then we say, you know what? I could be a blessing to that person. So prayer is not simply going to God and informing God. Prayer is going to God and praising him and listening to him and then responding to him. It's as much about our realizing our needs and our sins and our, our lack of abilities as, as much as it is realizing that God has the provision and God has the power and God has the authority to act and to move. So we don't pray to inform him, but we do pray for those things. So he gives us the model prayer. He says, pray like this then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's saying his name is holy. It is to be revered. It is to be honored. It is to be respected. He is our Father. Now there's an interesting word here. Our. God gave us a prayer and he begins it by saying our Father. Now you could say that's just because he's speaking to a group. He's trying to be inclusive. Instead of just saying my Father, he's saying our. But if you look at the prayer, you see a certain communal nature to it. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's a sense that the, when we pray to God, we remember that we are not alone. We're a part of a family. We're a part of a group. We're a part of a church. We're a part of, of a collection of believers. And so when we pray, we don't only pray for, for me, myself, my four, and no more. We pray for each other. We pray that God would not only bless, I don't pray that God would just bless my family. I pray that God would bless our family. I don't just pray that, that my daily needs would be met. I pray that all of us might be blessed with provision and care from God. This prayer forces us to remember that we're not alone. And that we have a relationship not just with God, but with each other as well. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there's two ways, well, there's a lot of ways, but there's a, two big ways to look at verse 10. One is, is the sort of a deterministic way. You know, God, your will is going to be done, your way is going to be done, you're going to do what you're going to do, and I just need to get out of the way and let you work. I can't change anything. Uh, you're in total, complete control, so I'm not going to pray anything. I'm not going to do anything, and whatever you want to happen is just going to happen. Now, we understand the sovereignty of God. We do understand that God is in control. That's why we can praise Him. That's why we can put our trust in Him. That's why we can have a hope for the future, because we know that God is in control. But we don't, we don't, praise, we don't pray that in this sort of, well, hands off, well, I can't, I'm just not going to do anything kind of way. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so that we might see those intentions, those plans, those desires, those goals of God made manifest here on this earth. We learn a lot of the desire and the will of God in his word. We see his promises. We hear his truth. So we pray, God, just as you have willed it to be, as you are experiencing it in heaven, may we see that here. Do you know there's no one going against the will of God in heaven right now? There's no heartache. There's no suffering. There's no bickering in the halls of heaven right now. People aren't killing other people. Christians aren't yelling at other Christians in heaven. May we see that kind of harmony and that kind of unity and that kind of healing here in this place. There are other things that we can pray about. And I want to pause and, and just, like I say, in just a few minutes, we're going to pray for our nation. But how do we pray for a nation? How do we pray for a people? We can look at God's word and see what God desires, and we pray that for one another and for our world. I'll give an example. Jeremiah 29, 7 says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. This is the prophet Jeremiah speaking to the Jewish people who are in exile in Babylon. And he says to his, the Jewish people, Pray for the welfare of Babylon. If Jeremiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, can tell the Jewish people, pray for your captors, pray for that place where you are exiled, surely we who are believers can pray for this nation where we have such freedoms. We should go to God and pray for the welfare of our nation. We should pray for healing. We should pray for for a togetherness. We should pray for strength. And then it's something else. Second Chronicles 7.14, a famous passage. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now again, this was written first and foremost to the Jewish people, and it was about Israel. And I know that America is not a replacement for Israel, and that we can't take all the promises that God gave to the nation of Israel and apply them carte blanche to every situation. But hear what it says here. If my people, that's believers, that's Christians, if we would humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, he would heal our land. He will hear from heaven and he will hear our land. God will answer that prayer. Sure he will. We are his people. And we need to turn from the wickedness that we see in our world. Pump again through our entertainment systems. Pump again through our, through our news springing up in the depths of our own souls. We need to return, or re turn away from the wickedness. We live in an age where we are seeing the spirit of lawlessness grow. Both lawlessness against the laws of God and the laws of man. We're seeing that spirit rising up, and we who are believers, if we who are Christians in this nation would do this, revival would grow. So we pray for prosperity and for strength. We pray for revival and redemption and, and repentance. Second Chronicles 20, 12 says, O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? 
For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming up against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That could be a motto for every single one of us sometimes. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. God, there's so much strife, there's so much turmoil, there's so much fighting, there's killing, there's looting, there's burning. God, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Our hope is in you. So we pray for God to step in, to intervene. We know from Scripture this is, this is inspired Scripture, so we pray that. And the application may be different. But the, our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we turn to him and seek his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, theologians had a problem with this one. Church fathers looked at this and said, surely that's not talking about bread. Surely, the, Jesus isn't saying, give us this day our daily bread means give us bread. It's got, it's got to be bigger than that. So over, throughout the years, they started saying, this is talking about communion. This is talking about that when we take the bread and we say, this is my body, take and eat. Jesus is surely calling us to say that this is about our relationship to him. This is looking at God's word. This is talking about scripture, that, that this is our, our daily bread of scripture that we take, and, and it touches our soul. Surely Jesus doesn't mean that we should go to God and say, God, give me bread. I think that's exactly what it is saying. God knows. See, in, in Jesus' day, you got up in the morning, you didn't know if you were going to work, many of you. You would have gotten up, and you would say, well, I know that there's the, the, uh, the farmer down the road has a field. Maybe I should go and see if he needs some help harvesting. And, or I know, I know a man up the hillside, he has a vineyard. Let me see if I can go prune some of the vines or pick some of the grapes or, or something. And you would go and you would show up and say, do you have any work today? And he may say yes. And so you get to work that day, and you get a little money at the end of the day, and you get to buy something to eat. Or you may show up, and he says, no, I'm good. I've got enough workers already. And you go home, and you don't have any money. And guess what? You don't eat. In that day, in that culture, we say we live paycheck to paycheck. A lot of Americans right now live paycheck to paycheck. They live day to day not knowing whether or not they would eat. So when this says, give us this day our daily bread, it is saying, God, give us what we need today. Give us the food to eat. God knows you need it. He made your bodies to need it. So we turn to him and we say, God, please provide. And then as he does provide, anybody get up this morning and have breakfast? Some of you didn't have breakfast. I didn't have breakfast. You may have coffee. Oh, there the hands go up. Yeah. We should praise God that we had the ability to go and get these beans that are grown in other countries and have been brought here, and we praise God that we can have that. We praise God for the food that we're about to eat at, at, at lunch. Now, while there are Americans and while there are believers right now who are going hungry today, we who have been blessed should should turn this prayer ever so slightly. Instead of saying, God, provide for me today, we should say, thank you, God, that you provided for me today. And then as we know that there are others who are hurting, who are hungry, we can be the conduits by which they get the provision from the Lord. We have a basket at the back of the room, at the back of the sanctuary. That as we give a little bit, we're going to take it to the food shelter so that the others can have something else to eat for the food pantry. So as we pray this prayer, not only do we thank God for his provision, we also can use it as an opportunity to bless others. <clears throat> and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Sin is talked about here as a debt, a debt that we need to seek forgiveness for. And then as we receive forgiveness from God for our sins, then we offer that same forgiveness to other people. I'm going to repeat this theme in a minute. So I'm not going to spend time on it here. And then it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We know that God is not going to bring us into sin. So then the question would be, so why pray the prayer? This is more a prayer about testing than it is about 
about God leading us into a temptation. We know that there are going to be times where we are tested by God, but we don't have to seek out those opportunities. We don't have to say, I'm strong, I'm mature. God, see how strong I am. See how, see how much temptation I can with, 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 withstand. We don't pray like that. We pray because we have weaknesses. We, have, we, we are morally flawed. Until our final justification, we're still going to slip up. So we don't go out seeking the temptation. We don't go out picking the fight with our, with our failures. We pray that God will protect us from those. And then he repeats, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is not the sum total of God's word on forgiveness of sin. This is a small portion of it to teach a principle. And the principle is that we should, just as much as we've enjoyed forgiveness for our sins, we should offer that same forgiveness to other people. And if you have a problem forgiving someone else for the sin that they've done to you, if someone has hurt you or badmouthed you or, or forgotten something or belittled something that you thought was important and they didn't think it was important or they said something or they did something that hurt your feelings, uh, it could have been here, it could have been in your family, it could have been a co-worker, and, and you look at that person and you struggle to forgive them, then you need to do a gut check. Because either you aren't fully appreciating the forgiveness that you have from God, or you don't fully appreciate the gravity of the sin that you committed against God. Our sins against God are great and many. If I were to ask you to sit down and list out your sins, just for the past, just, just for the past two years, how long of a list would you have? Think, just think, you know, you know yourselves. This isn't time of testimony. Just think about it. What would you write down? Which one of the Ten Commandments? Which one of the seven deadly sins? Which ones are the attitudes of the, of the pagan? How, how great would our list be just for the last two years? And we can take that full list. We can take any list. We can take our lifelong list of sins and errors and mistakes that, uh, excuse me, that are, a, that are an affront and an offense to the nostrils of God. He can't stand to be in the presence of our sins. And we can take those and we have the ability to lay them at the foot of the cross and be forgiven of every single one of them. And then we look at the person who insulted us one day and said, I will never get over that. Something's wrong in that equation. And Jesus says something here that should, that should challenge us. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now again, that's not the sum total of teaching on forgiveness, but it is one of them. Are you holding a grudge? Is there someone who has done something to you, something you didn't like they did, something you thought they should have done that they didn't do, something that they should have said, or something they did say that you didn't like? And you're holding on to that, and you can't let that go, and it just bothers you every time you see that person, and you think about it, and you dwell on it, and, and you spend time thinking what you should have said when they said it. And all those other things. And you're carrying around that monkey on your back. You're carrying around that baggage. And you won't let it go. That's not just a problem with your relationship with them. That is a problem with your relationship with God. That you can't let that go and you can't forgive. I'm not saying that you have to make, that you're going to have total, complete peace with that individual. I'm not saying you need to offer over un, un, unlimited trust to that individual. I'm not saying you had to spend all your time with that individual. But you need to have a heart that can forgive them because you have a heart that has been forgiven. 
So as our, we close our time together today, I put two challenges, two requests in front of you. Well, because of the 4th of July, we take the opportunity to pray for our nation. I also ask you to search your heart. Is there some, is there some area in your life that you are holding a grudge and you are finding it impossible to forgive? I encourage you to go to God right now. Say, God, just as you have forgiven me, I seek to forgive this individual. You may not even have to talk. You may, it, this, I'm not even calling you to talk to them right now. I'm not asking you to call them and say, hey, I've forgiven you. This person may be dead. This person may be long gone. This may be someone who early in your life hurt you, and you're still holding an offense against them. But it might be somebody you have to deal with every day. And after you pray this prayer of forgiveness, after you say, God, I am going to release this person from my, from my, um, the, the baggage I'm carrying from them, the grudge I'm holding against them, God might just say to you, then go and restore that relationship. Because restoration is a part of forgiveness. So that might just happen. So as you pray to forgive, there also might be the call from God to restore. So be ready for that. But I invite you to come down. I know we can't crowd around this altar. I know we can't for, for social distancing reasons. But I welcome some of you to come down, and if you have a unforgiveness in your soul, then lay that down here. But I also ask some others of you to come down and pray for our nation. And Matt, what I'm going to do, Joanne, what I want to do is ask you to come on up, and I want you to start playing, uh, does it tell it to Jesus? I must tell Jesus, just let Joanne play it for a few minutes. I'm going to welcome anyone who would come down. We're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray, as we read the scriptures, that God would bless this nation. Just as the Israelites prayed for Babylon, let us, let us pray for our nation, that God would bless it. We're going to pray that, that believers would humble themselves and that there could be a return to God. We're going to pray that while we don't know how to cure all the evils in our world right now, we're going to turn our eyes to God. So I'd ask, ask, I'd ask a few of you, as Joanne begins to play, come down and join me at the altar, and then, and then in just a few minutes, Matt will lead us in song. You can stay where you are. You can pray right where you are. But let's go to God in silent prayer, either for an unforgiving heart or for our nation at whole. Let's pray together.